First and foremost, giving honor and praise to Yah, the creator and the maker of heaven and earth. Started out in the camp called Kosheri in the Bronx, under Mora Yosef, eventually going to Hashaba, under my teacher there, Cohen Levy. May, he re may they both rest in peace. And basically, after that, basically wanted to get into some kind of studies. When the conscious community decided it was a good idea to try to sit there and present the ideology, teaching, and thought that um, the, there was no people called Israel. Something had to have been done. I realized a lot of the references were never checked into, like the Assyrian record, um, the Moabite record, the um, Tacitus record. The record of many other people was not really referenced. They just try to focus on Egypt and then give you on top of that a commercialized form of Egypt where they do not speak upon why is it that the dynasties like Eusebius spoke about are co regent why is it that Sennusip the first and Amenemet, Amenemet, the first also ruled at the same time? But they try to give you a chronology that pushes the date back further and further and further. Then when Kemet or slash Egypt doesn't work, then we see, okay, now we got to go down the Kush. Then when you run down the Kush, you see the Habesha and the so-called Falasha talking about a Beta Yisrael. Problem. Then you got to go and sit there and run all the way over to the other side. Mm. So now you go over to Nigeria where the Igbo people in part saying that they from the children of Israel. Then you got to sit there and then maybe try to talk about Northern Africa. Then if you try to talk about Northern Africa, then you sitting there got to sit there and be like, okay, this place ain't even run by black people. Let's now sit there and talk about Hapsetse. And then let's talk about this lady and that lady and this great queen and this great king. They're giving you... Uh, a version of Egypt that is not showing you the populace of the peoples. See, the Bible and the scriptures, it shows you the layman. It shows you the prophet Elisha and Elijah speaking to the common woman that has no man and has a son. So you see that aspect going on there. In the scriptures, you sit there and see the situation where a lady wasn't able to give birth, but she dedicated her child that she would have, blessed be the Most High, to the Levites to do a service unto the Creator. So you see, in, in that case, being the prophet Samuel's birth. Point I'm saying is you see the common and the low people. You see when David, before he got anointed, his father didn't even think to sit there and bring him out. Like, oh, these are all your sons? Well, these are all of the sons here. There's some little boy out there in the back tending the sheep. Bring him out. So that shows you the people. It shows you, unfortunately, the griminess that also happened. What I'm saying is, check this here. Bring her up there. I'm a, he slept with her, then bring her husband into the army, then have him killed and everything. You don't get a romanticized thing. A lot of people anti-Tanakh, anti-Bible say, oh, you want to follow a book where the king sat there and banged another man's wife and everything like that. That happens to this day, unfortunately. So you can't pick what seems pretty and then sit there and want to model yourself after that as a legacy. Now, you can pick what's pretty and nice and make that become your legacy. Righteousness establishes a nation, says Proverbs. So you can sit there and let that be. If you know somebody did something in the past that's wrong, you don't do the same thing. But that doesn't change the fact of where your identity comes from as a people because you don't like the history of that people. That's one thing to be pointed out and noted and understood. Now I want to go, for edification purposes, this book right here. We're going to read just a part of it, right? This book right here is entitled, Oxford History of Ancient Egypt. Going to go to page 480 and then move on from that particular point right here. Right? It says this The dates for the majority of the Pharaonic period from 3000 to 664 BC are based mainly on ancient kings' lists, where they refer to the Palermo inscription, what they refer to as the Saqqara list and the Yabados list. You understand? Dated inscriptions and astronomical records in the New Kingdom and Third Intermediate period. Now, New Kingdom is from Dynasty 18 going on. Third Intermediate Period, we're talking Dynasty 21 going on, right? The margin of likely error is about a decade, but this tends to increase as we move further back in time. So that in the Old Kingdom, it might be as many as 50 years. And in the First Dynasty, it might be as high as 150 years. So this is why they're not able to really give a good chronological timeline. Now, when you go in your own time into a book entitled Egypt of the Pharaohs by Sir Alan Gardiner, he speaks about in Dynasty 2, the way they calculated the time is by the way the animals gave birth. So that means about maybe every two years, they count as one year. And every two years when they had to sit there and count the flock, they sat there and that, that's another year. So it's very um, Egyptian-orientated as far as their kings are concerned. Let me bring it up to date and time. 
America had two presidents at one time. One guy named Lincoln, the other guy named Jefferson Davis. But when you look, brothers and sisters, at the list of the presidents, you will never see Jefferson Davis anywhere by Lincoln. Why? Because during the era of Lincoln, he was the president of the United States. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederate States of America. So when the United States got a hold of their own records to make it for themselves, Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens gets what we call no play. So that's something to be noted and understood. So when Horam had decided to try to get rid of the memory of Akhenaten, and then you got the situation with Sikta and Taraswet in Dynasty 20, don't be surprised. See, it's the same little type of thing. Same in the scriptures. You know how many Israelites do not know there was a king after Saul but before David? His name was Ishbosheth. But because the chronicles of Judah heavy rain more heavy, you actually don't read much about the two years between the death of Saul, the rule of Ishbosheth, and David himself. Even though David himself gave him much respect. Because the prophecy in Israel, the scepter, is not to depart from Judah. So, therefore, we have to understand the culture of a people to understand why a people may do a certain thing. Now, getting back, if you will, concerning this subject matter right here. How did they get it as stated come from the Abidos, the Saqqara, the Royal Touring Papyrus, and the situation that they have with the um, Palermo inscription? Palermo, Dynasty 5 and 2 1. Then they got. Abydos, Saqqara, both dated to Dynasty 19. And the Royal Torah and Papyrus dated to Dynasty 19. Question is, how then do you get the timeline after it? Because many scholars don't credit what they say other ones like Octopanus and them wrote after the era of Manetho. So if that's the case, you have to then explain a lot. For instance, brothers, sisters, if we will, I want to show this particular point right here. This book is called Atlas of Ancient Egypt, right? We're going to go, brothers and sisters, to page 36 in this particular one. And it says the following. The margin of error, E-double-R-O-R, -R, rises from about a decade in the New Kingdom in the Third Intermediate Period to as much as 150 years for the beginning of the First Dynasty. Most Twelfth Dynasty dates. Now, Twelfth Dynasty is the Middle Kingdom. I speak about that as we go along heavily for a reason. Are fixed precisely in 18th and 19th dynasty ones must be fit, must, pardon me, must fit one of the three astronomical determined alternatives. Here a combination of the middle and lowest ones are used. All dates from 664 BC are precise. All native rulers mentioned in part two are included in this list. This here is a list a part of what's going on with the kingdoms of Egypt. You see here, Dynasty 14. What does the pink highlighted part say? A group of minor kings who are probably all contemporary with the 13th or 15th dynasty. Now how am I comfortable talking about this and then mention the situation after Saul's death with Ishbosheth Shed and David is because Israelites are not trying to bang against nobody about a timeline and chronology. You had King Uzziah and King Yotham of Judah, and they had a co-regency, when unfortunately Uzziah got smitten with leprosy. So that's in the book of Chronicles. So we're not trying to sit there and push the Israelite timeline way back to try to sit there and make it seem as if it's older than it actually was. So that's the point in getting into that aspect right there, putting that book to the side for the moment. Next thing, brothers and sisters, is to talk about this. And we spoke about this even on Maccabees TV. Subscribe to it. M A C C A B E E S. Maccabees TV. First intermediate period, right? From Dynasty 7 to Dynasty 10. That was all within the same area of timeline. They all was concurrent. So you got 1, 7, 8, 9, 10, all ruling at the same time. Second intermediate period is Dynasty 14 to 17. How does that become important? Because this is when the Hypsos subject comes into play. Because you had Dynasty 15 and 16, which was of the Hyksos. Then you had 14 and 17, which was in Thebes. Or as um, the ancient Egyptians called it, the land of Waset. You understand? Not jumping the gun, but 
the same particular land was defeated in battle when Asohadon and also his son Ashurbanipal actually defeated it. But that being later on in history in 671 BC. But the point I'm getting back to now then is in the third intermediate period. As we read in this book right here, where it shows you a very, not to be disrespectful, sloppy issue. But it's not sloppy in light of Egyptian records because like Columbus writings, Egypt ain't right for the world. So we're saying that it don't fit, but the pharaohs of Dynasty 26 wouldn't say that because they wrote for themselves. It only becomes sloppy when you try to fit that into the records of every other people upon the earth. And you can't mesh it like that. Not when you got a culture that says that we are the best and we are the top. How you gonna try to fit what they felt in timeline and mix it in with everybody else's. So that's how it goes down with that. You're going to run eventually into a problem. Now, this book here, Egypt of the Pharaohs, what we just did is an intro. Now we get into, as the brother Hasha says, you got to give the milk and the meat. We're now getting to the meat. This here is called Egypt of the Pharaohs by Sir Alan Gardiner, page 131 for edification purposes. Because a lot of times they try to say, not that we got to go bang against them each time. Yo, Israelites don't study anything outside of the Bible. What happened is, that's the one book you don't study. This is why you're saying Abraham instead of Abraham. This is why you're making statements of that nature. Okay? This, however, is not, is a not suitable place and which to summarize the dealings of Egypt with its northeastern neighbors throughout Dynasty 12. The prophecy of Nefertiti. Now, I spoke about that prophecy of Nefertiti with a couple of brothers, and they got it twisted with Nefertiri. No, Nefertiti. Stop Googling and sit there and pay attention. All right? The prophecy of Nefertiti had emphasized even more strongly than the similar compositions above noted the incursion of the Asian addicts the Amu into the Delta now what I want to do brothers and sisters for edification purposes because we just spoke about Dynasty 12 and the issue of the Amu or the Asiatics going into brothers and sisters what we call the Delta of the land of Egypt right this here is the Delta the northern part of Egypt as we see right here the northern part we see all of this right here that's the Delta. That was called Tameri in the ancient world of Egypt. Alright? So let that be noted and understood. That's what that's talking about right there. Now, moving on, if we will, to get into the meat of the issue, even more so. Brothers and sisters, the Pharaoh we spoke about named Amenahat the first with the prophecy in the first he built and had constructed this thing here, what is called the Walls of the Prince. This was to keep out the people that the records record as the Amu or the Set you from the land of Egypt. Now, for respect purposes, let's understand. The people that was called Amu, Set you, Retenu, Shasu, all of these terminologies are Egyptian terminologies that was placed upon other people. But these are not names that they called themselves. I explained before in um, the South Showtime show, you will have a fool unfortunately 200 years later looking for somebody called the wetbacks that used to bend over like this with cement if they did not understand that that was a derogatory generic term made for people properly more so called Mexicans. This is why in all that getting get understanding. You see so let that be noted and understood. Now if we will this here is a picture in part of the ammo. Now this right here for edification purposes, you can look this up. It's called the core, K-H-O-R. And that is also said, brothers and sisters, as the people of Aram. And the Arameans are the people of Aram. And they were called Syrians by the Greeks. Now, I want it to be noted, Assyrian and Syrian are two different peoples. Assyria and Syria are two distinct different people. One in a biblical term is from Ashur. The other one is from Aram. Though they physically looked alike, they knew their ethnicity to be different. Now, when you get to the era of Tiglat Pilnasar defeating Rezin, the king of the Syrians, shows you that they were still 
not the same people. So let that be noted. Now many times they call these people here the Semites. And this is how you know, even though just you like you read in the Bible here like lands will and feet the color of um, burnt brass. Oh, I still think they white. How is that possible when you can look at this picture here and tell that they are not? These people are not what you call white people. Furthermore, if you look at this right here, this is another picture. Now this is coming from the tomb of Kemun Hotep. Now this is my argument to people who try to say that the Hyksos only got in there in what you call Dynasty 13. Because Kemun Hotep was the advise was in that was an advisor to Sinestric the first and the second. So the fact that he was in Dynasty 12, and this is from his tomb, shows you being that Dynasty 12 and 13 at that time was not co-regent, that means that the people later on called the Hyksos have to have been in Egypt before what we call Dynasty 13. So I just want to sit there and let that to be noted. And so this is not to sound haughty or belligerent or arrogant, but a lot of times they misunderstand and misquote certain things. Now, if we will, brothers and sisters, I like to go in the same book here, Egypt of the Pharaohs, page 144, all right, for edification purposes, and it reads as such. In another case, a wife, this is speaking about the Middle Kingdom, check this part out here. In another case, a wife was left among other things for and move, Asiatic slaves. Such documents had to be formally witnessed and deposited to the recorder. So we already explained that the term Amu, Set, You, Retenu, so forth and so on is Egyptian terms referring to people who we call Asiatics in history. Now these Asiatics, brothers and sisters, are not, I repeat, they are not the Cambodians and the Chinese. Alright, so just want to sit there and let that be noted and understood. When you look in your own time into what they call the tomb of Rachmere, and you will see the people making bricks and everything like that. As a matter of fact, this here is from the tomb of Rechmore. And everyone likes to say, being against Israel, oh, they're not slaves. Hold the camera there. I want to show somebody something, if we can. This here is a book about slavery. It's called, what? History of Slavery. What do we see here? Somebody just working, right? Are they just working? And on the bottom, if you read the caption, it spoke about somebody being punished for doing a wrong during their time of enslavement. Then we go, and as I want to correlate this to let it be noted and understood, right? These people here, this is from the West Indies. Are they just working? They don't look like they're being enslaved. They look pretty well. Picture looks nice, right? But you notice something? What is homeboy right here doing? How come if everyone is supposed to have hands on deck, why come he's not working with them? And, in light of that, can you please explain to me who this gentleman is and how come he's just sitting there as if nobody else is doing something? Now, when I was a child, that was a behind whooping. I remember I actually got a spanker for that. My sister was up there cleaning and everything, made my mother rest in peace and everything. And I was up there watching TV like, are you going to, pow, are you going to help? You see everybody else is doing something. Why are you just sitting there acting like ain't nobody else? Put your hands on deck. What are you doing? You know why? Because this is called enslavement. And this is why if you look closely, you see him with a stick getting ready as if he's ready to hit somebody. That's like that picture we showed with the Portuguese. So don't think for a second that they were just simply just working. Or they're just workers. I never accept that terminology. Not with the history that's being presented and the evidence of the pictures. Because he's sitting there like, if you don't make this quota of bricks like Exodus 5 says, you know what's up. So let that be noted and understood. Now, to get into the meat of this particular part, same book, we are in Egypt with the Pharaohs, page 203, right? This is under the situation when the Thebes, or the Theban people, began to come back to power. Now, let it be noted, we are not trying to bash Egypt, because the Bible bangs against the house of Israel quite often. Jeremiah 5, for among my people are found wicked men. So we are not here to say that Israel's ways is better, we are saying Torah is better. And in light of that, we are saying that Torah is not from my eye. 
Because in Ma'at, there's no diet. In Ma'at, there's no Shabbat. In Ma'at, there's no sacred days to be set aside. In Ma'at, there is no prohibition against idolatry. Israelites bang against each other for a misunderstanding of Genesis 1.14 with the Shabbat. The lunar Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. And you see Israel going at each other like that. Why? Because each of us are trying to help the other keep what we understand as Shabbat better. Now, if you can show me from any squad or any group of people or anyone where they're saying Shabbat Hotep, please let me know. I said it on Maccabees TV in the past, and it still has not come to pass. They do not teach to keep the Shabbat. And that's a very important thing in Israel. I'm not saying I've even been the best Sabbath keeper. I'm not saying that. But violation in Torah of the Shabbat is a death penalty. So we see that's what you call capital punishment. It's not a light matter in the house of Israel. So let that be noted. This book right here, Egypt of the Pharaohs, reads as follows. Page 203. Like the figures quoted of the Shasu of their doings, and for the Koreans who may derive their name, later extended to all Palestinians and Syrians. So that is to say that the term Shasu began to be used for other people called the Palestinians. Now we know the word Palestine was given to that land by Hadrian of Rome after the situation of um, 135 AD. All right? And Syrians from the Hurrian invaders from the north, immediately preceding their is a reference to the Apiru, a much discussed term which we cannot afford to ignore. A few years ago, it was confidently asserted, pay attention, it was confidently asserted that these people were identical with the Hebrews of the Old Testament. But this is now denied by all but a few scholars. It is, however, generally accepted that they are to be equated with the Habiru better Habiru of the Amarna tablets. Apparently a generic term for outcasts or bandits belonging to no fixed ethnic groups in Egyptian texts, they appear as Asiatic prisoners employed in stone queries. So this right here is very important for edification purposes. So there's only but a few scholars who will sit there and state that the Hebrews of the Old Testament is not documented inside of Egyptian records. Doesn't mean that they wasn't there. Just the same. You had slaves in the United States that were not African American, quote unquote. The Chinese were also slaves because they helped build the railroad. So when they say the slaves, you got to know that was also a generic term. So let that be noted and understood. We have to know history in its proper context. Now, moving on, if we will. I want to show this picture right here. This book coming from a store called Strands in New York, Atlas of Ancient Egypt. We're going to go to page 28, right? And show a particular thing. Because we read several instances of the um, Asiatic prisoners in Egypt. If you can focus right here. This right here is a picture of captives being inside of the land of Egypt. So you see them tied and bind up and so forth and so on. So we have to then wonder why America praised Egypt so much. Because it too was founded upon slave labor. Then if we go into another book, or the same book that is, right on page 34, we see even yet the following. Please explain homeboy here with an afro that's a captive in the middle kingdom of Egypt. This is from the artwork of ancient Egypt as a captive. See this ain't from the Bible. If you notice I mentioned biblical people, but I didn't sit there and read one part of the Bible as of yet. And it's not that we're afraid to or intimidated to do so, but it's just that it says in our record, a matter is established by two or three witnesses. So now you've got some who say, well, are you saying that those people were the Israelites? Are you showing the documentation saying that they're not the Israelites? That's the next question. Because the Israelite record speaks about them being enslaved in Egypt. And the Egyptians so far have not been shown in record to state that they were never slave masters. If you can show me where the Egyptians stated those Hebrews were liars, they were never slaves here. 
and then I'll show you the Brooklyn Papyrus 35.1446 and then I will show you the Lehun Papyrus then I will show you the Emperor Papyrus where it speaks about the female slaves having gold, turquoise, and lapis lazuli which they called another name for it in ancient Egyptian Kes bad if I remember the pronunciation correctly you understand? where they actually got what they call the lapis lazuli from the Sinai and when they talked about doing business with Biblos and when they got the Nakara with the lions coming out of Ethiopia because Kemet don't have lions native just as much as Italy doesn't have alligators that's native they get that from somewhere else the temple that Solomon built with the cedars of Lebanon Lebanon's in not in Jerusalem they did trade and business with other people stop presenting a mythological Egypt where everything is just all there and then after that era when Mark Antony gets his behind beat by Augustus and his man Marcus Agrippa you then now got to sit there and try to go and talk about Africa and the Akan and this and that don't hop sketch like that because ancient Egypt felt if you did not die in the land of Simatawi then your soul would not be in eternity they felt that if you died let's say over in the land of the Red Tenu you dead like you, you was cut off you understand so let that be noted and understood so one of the things brothers and sisters to get back into this and that is the following wanted to just break that down to show that the Egyptian chronology and the fact that they did have slaves documented from writings as well as artwork now what we're going to get into right now in this history presentation is part two and get into the Bible if you will brothers and sisters I have the scriptures here this is the Gideon's version alright I want to go into Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 and then get into some history so that way we can begin to know and understand some things and then conclude out alright here is what we read and we quote I will bless those that bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in all and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed so this is a portion that was given to Abraham so let's see if we can do the timeline if we will and see if the nations were blessed knowing the situation of what was placed upon Abraham in the middle kingdom of Egypt right we already spoke about the Asiatics being in the land of Egypt let's see what happened there to see how Egypt would have been blessed if we will have the Oxford history of ancient Egypt we're going to go to page 175 alright and let's see what it says here concerning this particular thing in this moment it says this there is evidence from Tel El Dabba that a community of Asiatics albeit very Egyptianized existed there as early as the early 13th dynasty so far however this is only convincing archaeological evidence for a population of Asiatics within Egypt but living differently from the Egyptians during the Middle Kingdom there are also references in contemporary texts of camps of Asiatic workmen alright so that's what you call on uh, what they call draining out things of the Apigo and so forth and so on now the next thing we want to get into concerning that same book Oxford History of Ancient Egypt we're going to go to page 319 to confirm what we're speaking on and then move on further in history and it says the following a reasonable archaeological case however can be made for a fairly strong and continuous middle kingdom Egyptian economic presence in Palestine and Biblos probably periodically reinforced by military pressure the increasingly high numbers of Asiatics during to have been living in Egypt during the Middle Kingdom suggests that at least some were being brought in as prisoners of war so we see that's when in Dynasty 12 and 13 the Middle Kingdom of Egypt when the Asiatics the seed of Abraham were hitting on and getting to the children of Israel being in the land of Egypt at that time this is where we begin to see when they have their expedition to Nubia and Kakadak this is when they wound up being able to go and have some of the greatest literature and paintings and artwork that was done during the Middle Kingdom of Egypt 
When you go to what they call the mud brick pyramids of Amenhat the third, that is evidence of the fact that you had the Amu, the Asiatic workers in there, because they used the mud brick on art form or work in construction, archaeological stuff that was done during the people who came from the Levant, if you will. All right, so let that be noted and understood. All right, now when the children of Israel was leaving out of the land of Egypt, we know and understand as Wilkinson points out in his book, Rise and Fall of Ancient Egypt, that Dynasty 13 was plagued. And that's when they started to have all kinds of problems. Then the Amalekites, who was the second wave of the Hyksos that came in, you can confirm this when you go to the people of um, Shishai. This was part of the, um, the people of Anak or Talma. That was part of the Hyksos that went in with the second wave when the Israelites was coming out. So when you go to Exodus 17 and the Amalekites were attacking, remember the Hebrew word Amalek means warlike. So now you have two different ways of Hyksos, one in Dynasty 11, the other in Dynasty 13. The Israelites coming out was out of what they call Tel Edab'ah, when they go into this ref reference with Bitech and everything, where they just said, oh, they left all of their construction tools just on the ground and archaeological things and the Hyksos just came in and just took over is because Egypt was going through a whole lot at that point. So you can see why they didn't have later on what we know and understand as a co-regency. Because they had to try to sit there and get everything together to try to build themselves back up after the children of Abraham, the children of Israel, left out. So let that be noted and understood. Next, when speaking about the seed of Abraham being a blessing to the people of the world, Assyria, when did that happen is greatly during the era of Tiglat Pemesar III. He was also called King Pulu, you understand, of the Babylonians. So that's something to be noted and understood within history. He ruled from 745 to 727 BCE. And when you study history, you will notice that he did a lot of wars against the people of the Arameans, against the people of the Babylonians, against the Chaldeans, and also made a tributary of the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. So that is how, unfortunately for the house of Israel, but that's how they became a blessing because Israel brought the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. You see, so therefore they became a tributary and was a blessing to the other nations. Let's understand something from the Hebraic way of thinking. Hosea chapter 4, not verse 6, like many people might have thought. Let's go to Hosea chapter 4, verse 8. So let's begin to see some understanding concerning this moment. We are in the scriptures, Hosea chapter 4, we are in the 8th verse. All right, so we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter right here. It says this, They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on the iniquity. That's talking about the other nations in Israel and how they dealt with. So what's going on there is you had the other nations that eat up at the sin of the children of Israel. So in order for the nation to survive, we have to do wrong before the Most High. Hmm. Thus sin is promoted. Don't keep the Shabbat. Don't chastise your children. Pork is the other white meat, so forth and so on, just to give you an example, so that way we can go against the commandments of the Most High. It's not done by accident. So let's move on. The successor, if you will, of Tiglath Pelesar is the, the guy named Shalmanesar, Shalmanesar V in history. All right? He was the one that the Book of Kings speaks of when it says that they went up against the people of the northern kingdom of Israel from the land of Naphtali going all the way down to where the land of Judah was, or toward the, pardon me, toward the southern part of the land of Ephraim. So let that be noted. So the northern kingdom after that basically was at an end. There were still people of the northern tribes of Israel in the land, but the northern kingdom after the era of Hosea was demolished as a kingdom, not as a people off the face of the earth. So let that be noted in history. Second after that is the guy named Sargon. Now, mind you, Shalman and Saul also ruled in Babylon, where he was called Ululai, in history. So that's why it's important to understand timeline and world history. His successor, as stated, when you go into the book of Hebrewisms of West Africa, he is the one that Syrian records laid claim to actually being the one who conquered Samaria and carried 27,290 of his prisoners out to the province of the Assyrians. So let's understand something about the Bible. You got the Assyrian record speaking about them beating up Israel. Then you got the Bible speaking about the Assyrians beating up the people of Israel. Seems pretty concrete to me, don't you think? This right here is speaking about the captivity of the northern tribes from their land 
going into the province of the Assyrians. This is not denied in history. Next we see here a picture of Yehu, the king of Israel, bowing down to Shalmaneser III. And Sal Shotam show a video that was done, a presentation on YouTube, The True History of Kemet and the Hebrew Society, Part 1. I spoke about this. Then we got the Assyrian king Sennacherib. Sennacherib is the successor of Sargon. Alright? Next we got here, Shalmaneser V. Alright, so it can be noted and understood. These people were documented in history as far as from their own records, as far as attacking and beating up the Israelites. So, question then is before we continue, when the Israelite kingdom fell, and then Assyria fell to the Babylonians, what happened? According to Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 33, we read that Judah and Israel were oppressed together by Assyria and Babylon. Alright? So, the tribes of Israel partly was beginning to be dispersed as Deuteronomy 28 chapter verse 21 and 25 and 52 state. So, let that be noted. Brothers and sisters, the Assyrian Empire fell in the year 609 or 612 BCE to the guy Nebuchadnezzar, who was the father of the famous Nebuchadnezzar. That's what we're going to talk about right now. Nebuchadnezzar actually is documented in history from the Bible and from external references. He is noted with his man, if you want to call him that, the guy Nebuzaradan for attacking the tribe of Judah in first in the year 597 BCE and then again in 586 BCE now I want to show for edification purposes if we will this here is a book entitled the Bible as history in pictures we're going to go to page 270 alright so that way it can be noted and understood something of what we're talking about this here is a record from the Babylonian Timeline speaking in cuneiform of King Yahukinu or King Jehoiachin of Judah. King Jehoiachin is the grandson of Josiah, the king of Judah. King Josiah in history was assassinated by Necho Rehembere of Dynasty 26 of Egypt because what was happening is Egypt was beginning to fall during the era of King Josiah, Assyria was beginning to fall, and as you go in that book, Atlas of um, Ancient Egypt, it will show you that the Babylonians and the Assyrians were at war with each other and Egypt attempted to help them. But when you go to first, pardon me, second Kings 24, verse 7 and 8, it says the king of Egypt came not up out of his land, for he took, for the king of Babylon took all that had belonged to the king of Egypt. See, the Bible is not biased. It shows you that Egypt did have provinces in the east. You see what I'm saying? So it's showing you that right there. When you study archaeology and you read about the place called Beit Chian, and everything of that sort, it shows you that they had a stella of Ramsey II that has been found here. It shows you the Egyptian artifacts in the land of Israel, which takes you back to Ezekiel 20, verse 6 and 7, where Israel unfortunately began to follow the wild ways of the ancient Egyptians and diplomacy and not regulating themselves back into their own culture. But getting back into this portion right here, this says in part, two fragments of clay tablets which were found in Babylon and which contained lists of rations delivered to captives there. The cuneiform text reads as follows, Ten cell of oil for Yahu King, King of Judah. So, therefore, you have Ray Higgins. I want you to see this, please, because you're saying everything in the Bible is plagiarized out of Egypt. So show me a king named Yahu Kinu in there. Please sit there and show that at 18 years old, he being taken a captive. Show me that inside the walls of the Metuneta and Karnak. Show me that inside of the walls of Medinet Habu. Please do, because so far it has not been shown. So let that be noted. This right here is a Babylonian record of them taking over the king of Judah. How then can you say that the Bible is plagiarized from Egypt when nations like Assyria, but take that pillar saw, when you go into a book, this book here, speaks about taking the tribe of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, when you go into another book, 
speaking about the Misha Stella, where King Misha of Moab speaks literally of the men of the tribe of Gad and the city of Aroer and everything of that sort. And he speaks about the king of Israel and Ahab of the house of Omri. You're not going to find that in the walls of the Metuneta. So what are these guys talking about? This is why they don't like talking about Babylon and Assyria. What I do this for is for edification purposes. I call this, talking about these other kingdoms in relation to the ancient house of Israel, I call this the jab to the ribs because this has so far never been contested. As a matter of fact, we're going to read another part. This is on the same book, page 251. This is the Sinat Cherib in Hezekiah prison. This is what he says about King Hezekiah. As for Hezekiah of Judah, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as innumerable small cities in their neighborhood, I besieged with scaling ladder siege engines. You see, this is what he's talking about. As of Hezekiah of Judah, so how do you say Hezekiah or Judah in Metoneta? Please sit there and explain how you have a king who sired a man named Esau-Hadon who eventually beat up Thebes. How do you have external references speaking of this? Please show me how this is religion. Because they try to say, oh yeah, Israelites are dealt with religion. Please show me how this is religious. The book of 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 13 and 14 confirms what we just read right here. That's not religious. That's about one kingdom laying siege and beating up another kingdom. See, you know what they call tribute of kings? It's the same thing in society today they call paying rent. You don't pay rent, they besiege you. They send a marshal. And you don't pay the tribute, they go and take the king Hosea and they put him in captivity. Zedekiah didn't pay tribute to Babylon, they took him and put his eyes out. And then after they slew his sons and they put him in a dungeon. So, similar premise, there's nothing religious about that. So we have to know and understand what is truthfully called righteousness, unfortunately is called religious by certain academia. So let that be noted. All right? Next thing we want to sit there and talk about concerning Babylon, getting into that, is he's called Babylon the Great, and it became great under Nebuchadnezzar. After Nebuchadnezzar, you eventually get, after Merodach Baladan and Legishai and the rest of them, you had the guy that was later on called Nebuchadnezzar, who in the Bible calls Belshazzar, the last king. He got defeated by Sargon II, a.k.a. Sargon the Great. You notice, pardon me, you notice how every time Israel's around them, they're called great. Nebuchadnezzar the Great, Cyrus the Great, Pompey the Great. Oops, jumping the gun. Now, let's get back to what we were talking about with this guy of the Persians. King of Power, 539 to 331, when Darius Commodus III got his butt beat up by Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedon. Alexander died in 323 BCE of the Greeks, and the Greek Empire after was divided between Ptolemy, Seleucus, Antigonus, Lysimachus, eventually, and Cassander. What happened in the year 312, three of those people came together against Antigonus and Lysimachus wound up getting the, Syria, getting the area that we call Babylon. History is noted in this. The Maccabees is during this era when you had the guy, Judas Maccabeus' father being Matitya, then he had his sons, John Maccabeus, Eliezer, Maccabeus, Judas Maccabeus, Jonathan Maccabeus, and Simon Maccabeus. Simon Maccabeus sired a son who was called John Hyrcanus. John Hyrcanus taught the Idumeans, that is to say the Edomites, the way of the culture of Israel. Now, Rome now comes up during this time, because at this time they now defeated the people of Corinth in 168 BCE. 167, 168, some people say different dates. Alright? So, now you got it to where Rome is now a power. And Rome becoming a power is very, very interesting concerning this. Because you have the Edomites or the Idumeans and the Romans as buddies. See? This was explained on Maccabees TV before. But I want to sit there and read something, if we will. 
This here is called Tacitus, the histories. Right? And I'm going to conclude with this. This is just a brief rundown in history. Not too deep, but hopefully understood. If not agreed, I don't mind commenting back to the comments addressed to me. And here's what he says concerning this. Pompey was the first Roman to subdue the Jews and set foot in the temple by right of conquest. That is the source of information that the temple contained no image of any god. Their shrine was empty, the innermost sanctuary void. The walls of Jerusalem were destroyed, but the temple was left standing. After Pompey, we're going to go down the line now. You had, in time, the god Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar and the guy, Herod the Great, the son of Antipater, were buddies and they were friends. You understand? So they made a league together to go against the house of Israel. So now you've got Esau and Rome. And this is why it makes sense when the Koram caves were being discovered. Why the Israelites called the Romans the Edomites. Because if I'm Jacob, my brother's Esau, you go and join up with the northern, northern, northern people to come against me. I'm not going to look at Rome. I'm going to look at you Esau and call all of y'all Esau. Because that's where my blood is. I'm going to sit there and associate that more so. That's why you find Rome referred to as Edom inside of that record. Now, getting back to the point of the matter here. After Julius Caesar and his situation, what happened with Antipater and later on with Herod, you had the successor, which was Augustus. So now, Herod had to sit there and make and become friends with Augustus in order to try to sit there and make a hegemony to become closed. When you go into Michael Grant's book, I'm going to cite this for those who care to read it. It's a book entitled, The History of Ancient Israel. Michael Grant in that book speaks about that during the era of the Romans, they tried to their best to destroy all of the seed of the house of David. This is why you know the Jewish man is not the true house of Israel. Because they don't try to persecute the Vatican for what they did. They don't try to persecute those wicked people for what they did because they went cahoots with them. You understand? Now, after Augustus, you had Tiberius. You read about Tiberius in the New Testament in Luke, the second chapter. You understand? Then after the situation with Tiberius and what he did, and he trying to make a hegemony over the house of Israel, among other peoples, because remember, Pompey wound up being assassinated. Then you had Julius Caesar, and he got assassinated. Then Augustus came in and he wound up dying. And then, mind you, Augustus died in 14 AD. Do you know, brothers and sisters, they didn't use soap in Rome until 50 AD? That's college material. What were they washing up in? Brushes, perfumes, and water. No soap was used. Really? Alright, let's move on. So the situation then becomes, you have it to where after, we spoke about Tiberius, right? Then we get to the freak of freaks called Caligula. You understand? Named Gaius, or Caligula, which they say means little boot, or whatever like that. And the same record we read out of Tacitus, Caligula went in his image put in the temple. And the Israelites was like, no, we'd rather sit there and fight you before we'll put that up in there. So, that didn't work out. Caligula invites all of the Roman leaders to a party. And I'm going to keep the language clean because there's children watching and we was reading the scriptures. So they got fellatio going, adultery going, all kinds of wickedness going. But you know what's even more wicked than the public sex? Is at that time Caligula was saying, try not to sleep with your wife. Let everybody sleep with everyone else's wife. So you had orgies going on with a woman and two men, neither of them being her husband. They eventually killed him. Okay, so now, after Caligula, you had Claudius, the first, because there was another guy named Claudius the second in the third century AD. But we're talking about Claudius the first. And then um, he wound up trying to sell cities of the house of Israel to other nations. When you go into a book entitled this book right here. 
Oxford History of the Roman World, it gets into that. Another thing to point out, we're going to deal with later on, concerning this, is another subject, and most people have seen this. But, speaking now, after the situation with Claudius, you had Nero, you know the guy who murdered his mommy, and his sister, and other people, and so forth and so on. That was Nero. He made it illegal to practice the Hebrew way of life inside of the Roman Empire. So then after Nero, and he winds up committing suicide, but prior to that, he sent this guy named Vespasian to go against the house of Israel. And Vespasian conquered Jotapata, Jet, um, Jericho, Samaria, Galilee, and so forth and so on. He then in turn sent his son, Titus. And this is when we get this right here, which they call the Archer Titus, when they carry the menorah of the second temple out of Jerusalem into what we know and understand so far hasn't been disproven, can't say it has been shown either, but carried to the Vatican. Maybe somebody else got more info on that. But now you had Titus and then Domitian. You understand? Because Titus, they said that was poisoned or he died of his own, but the dude died nonetheless. And after Titus, you had Domitian who got actually assassinated in the year 96 AD. So, Domitian, then you had Nerva. Why do I emphasize that name over and over? Because circumcision was banned during the era for the Israelites during the era of Domitian and Nerva. Then after Nerva, you had Trajan. Then after Trajan, you had Hadrian. And all of those people were bad guys. All of them were blessed because they was in cahoots with the house of Israel through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our portion to be a blessing to ourselves is to keep the laws, the statutes, and the commandments of the Most High Yah. So with that, many brief slash fast slash throwing a bunch of different references out of history, Shalom. I can be reached on uh, open Facebook, Moray Yish, um, Dan, Kashu Danite. Kashu, K A S H U B, Danite, D A N I T E, or email Moray Yeshaya at Yahoo.com. No, Moray1 at Yahoo.com. M O R E H O N E at Yahoo.com. Also, my YouTube page where this information and more pictures is shown is the YouTube channel Moray, M-O-R-E-H, second word is Y-E-S-H-I-A-H. -E so you can sit there and go there. Don't forget, subscribe to Maccabees TV, M-A-C-C-A-B-E-E-S. Shout out to the AOC, Lions of Israel, my brother Nasi, Yashuvel, my brother Zion Lex, and of course, my brother Divine Prospect. Shalom.